Good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. I'm looking forward to going into the presence of the Lord with praise and with worship. So I'd like to open up with a scripture. It's Psalm 63, and I'm going to read it from the message. God, you're my God. I can't get enough of you. Who can't get enough of him? Amen. I've worked up such a hunger and thirst for God, traveling across dry and weary deserts. So here I am in the place of worship, eyes open, drinking in your strength. Just take a moment and drink in his strength this morning because he's the strong God. He's the strong right arm. I drink in your strength and glory. In your generous love, I am really living at last. My lips brim praises like fountains. Get a visual of that. Praises like fountains that just keep going and going. I bless you every time I breathe. Isn't that a great scripture? My arms wave like banners of praise to you. So let's wave our arms like banners of praise and enter into praise and worship this morning and give him the glory that's due his name. Amen. runs for cover when you move no one's turned away is where you are fear turns into praises where you are left our chain so come move let justice roll like a river let worship turn Oh 
justice roll on like a river that worship turn into So 
come, move, let justice roll on like a river, let worship turn into revival, Lord lead us back to So come, move, let justice roll on like a river. Let worship turn into revival. Oh, lead us back to you. Lead us back. Go.
worry when giants come calling my name. My God is so much bigger than troubles I face. Why would I hunger for power or riches or fame? My God is so much better than all of these things. I won't be shaken. I won't. Nothing. 
I was reading this morning during my reading time about the women who went to the tomb totally expecting him to still be there. They had bought ointments, they had bought um, some um, spices to anoint the body that they thought was still there. Imagine their surprise. That's the way he wants to move for us too. Even when we don't expect it, expect it. They didn't expect that he was risen, but you know what? He was. So expect the impossible. We've been singing about it most of the morning. Expect him to move in your behalf. And watch his strong arm move for you. Amen. 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 So I just wanted to share this. Um, you know, when the disciples watched with, walked with Jesus, they knew him as a man. But then Paul... He had a revelation about Jesus. He, he said he was a man out of time. And we kept thinking about, I was praying about time this morning because of the time change. Right? So the disciples knew Jesus as a man and God, but as a man. Paul knew Jesus by revelation. And that's how we know him, by revelation. So we kind of follow kind of after Paul, right? <laughs> so he said in Hebrews 11:1, 1, now faith is. And just like we were just singing, Jesus already did it, everything on the cross. We just sang it, the victory has already been done. <laughs> so we speak to the mountains and they have to move. Amen? Amen? So it's time that we align our mouth with heaven and that we say, I am healed now. Not I'm going to be healed. Just erase that from your vocabulary, right? Amen? Because it's already done. If it's already done, that means that you are healed now. We are healed now. We're not waiting for him to do it. He already did it. Can you say amen? He already did it 2,000 years ago. Like they sang, the victory has already been done. It's already finished. So we line our mouths in this season just like Anita said, nothing's impossible now because we say it's already done. I have my healing now. I am prospering now. God's performing his word over my life now. Amen. So we're not going to say I'm going to be. Amen. So why is that? It's because our God is bigger, better, stronger greater than any demon than any giant that we're facing today amen are you done with worship what well, i'd like to welcome everyone this morning if you're new uh, for the first time and you did not get a mug please see one of the ushers and they will give you a coffee mug with our H on it. <laughs> uh, just a, a quick announcement. We are starting to transition um, from bottled water to purified water. If you've noticed in the lobby, we have a new water fountain. And it is purified water. So if you have one of those Yetis or... I don't even know all the brands of cups. Bring them in, fill them up with purified water. Yum. Uh, I'd like to take a few minutes for everyone to go say hello to someone that you don't know or somebody that you haven't seen for a while. We're only going to take a few moments. But go say hi.
I was just thinking, that is something, thank you. Thank my supplier. <laughs> Okay. Come back, come back. <laughs> it's what I love about this church. Everybody loves to visit with each other. Everyone truly enjoys each other. I think I should have had somebody set the countdown timer. <laughs> we'll have to think about that next time. That countdown, like 10, 9, 8. Okay, so we're going to transition to the offering, and I'm going to invite Gail up, who's going to take up our offering. And we can all give with a joyful heart because we have visited with each other. There you go. Good luck. <laughs> that's, well, that's a tough act to follow. Okay. Woohoo, everybody. We have so much fun at this church, I'm telling you. Hey, would y'all open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6? Or open your phones to Matthew chapter 6? I'll wait till y'all ready, because I got a word from the Lord. You're going to want to hear it. Get ready. <laughs> Are you ready? All right, Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to read out of the Amplified Version. I'm going to read 19, and it says, Do not gather and heap up and store for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust and worm consume and destroy. There's a lot of worms out there. <laughs> And where thieves break through and steal. But gather and heap up and store for yourselves treasure, treasures in heaven. Where neither moth nor rust nor worm consume and destroy. And where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And I'm going to skip to 33. But seek for, aim at, and strive after first of all his kingdom, his righteousness, his way of doing and being right, and then all these things taken together will be given you beside. And I just kept hearing, actually, verse 20 over and over this week about treasures in heaven, and we, Duke and I have been thinking a lot about heaven lately because our son changed addresses about five months ago. Matt's up there right now. He went from Boston Street to Streets of Gold, and I think about heaven a lot, and when I think about what heaven's like, I know it's a place with no lack. I know it's a place with 
filled with light and love and abundant provision. And verse 20 in God's word tells us that we can actually store up treasures there right here and now. And I'm convinced that everything we do here in this brief moment of time that we call life, because it is but a moment, everything we do here and now has an eternal reward. It counts for all eternity. You know, God is not after our money. Did you know that? He's not after your money. I know he wants you to all give this morning, but he's not after your money. But he does want your heart. And how we give shows him where our trust and our treasure really is. Okay? If you are trusting and putting your treasures in the world's economic system, you will be bound by that kingdom. You will. But if you take God at his word and invest in his kingdom, you open yourself up not only to a heavenly reward, but to unlimited provision right here on earth. And I happen to have a testimony. <laughs> Just happened this week. So thanks, Hannah. You're not here, Hannah. But thanks for asking us to do this this morning. Because right after Hannah asked us to do the offering, uh, Duke got a phone call. Well, back up a sec. We were invited to go to this event. And he needed a suit. And he lost so much weight that he didn't have anything that fit him. It looked like he was trying on his father's clothes, you know. <laughs> Just, you can't wear that. So the suit wasn't in the budget, and I'm very big on budgets in our house. We got a budget for it, plan for it. But God gave us the unction and the anointing. He said, go ahead, it's okay. So we were going to go get him a new suit. And before we went to the store, he got a phone call out of the blue from a funeral home where he had done a funeral. He, he's a hospice chaplain. And uh, about three years ago, he did a funeral for this family. And they had another family member pass last week. And they said, we want Pastor Duke to do the funeral. And the funeral guy said, well, I don't even know where Pastor Duke is. But somehow he found him. And he said, they really want you to do the service. So we had something planned that day, but he said, I'll rearrange it. He goes, I'll call you right back. And I, he said, you know, I really feel like God wants me to do this. And I said, well, we'll change our plans. Go ahead and do it. So he called him back, and he said, okay, I'll, I'll do it. And the guy said, well, the family wants to give you a gift. And he said, no. He said, I'm not doing this for a gift. He goes, I just want to bless the family. And he said, no, you are going to take this because the family's already given the money to me and I'm going to give it to you. And then we said, okay, Lord, you know, God uses people to bless you. Come on now. Don't close that door. If God wants to bless you through somebody else. So he said, okay. We went shopping yesterday for his suit. And I'm telling you this. The exact amount that he got from the funeral home, less, with four cents left over, was the amount we got the suit for. It was on sale. I had a coupon on my phone, and I knew it was from God. <laughs> Praise you, Father. Thank you, Lord. So, you know, if you've got some needs this morning, why don't the ushers come on and take up the offering? And if you've got some needs, you know, give them a chance to be God. You know, he knows what you need. It says in verse 8 right here, your father knows what you need before you ask him. Right? Come on, let's let him be God in our lives. Thank you, Father. All right, so go ahead and take it up. I want to pray for you. And uh, actually... 
I don't know. The Lord keeps telling me to do this, and I don't know how it's going to come out. But I want to just pray a blessing over you, and I'm going to sing it. <laughs> In the words of the great songwriter Brandon Lake, there's honey in the rock, water in the stone, manna on the ground, everywhere you go. You don't need to worry now that you know everything you need he's got. There's honey in the rock. Okay, be blessed everyone. Good morning, everyone. That was great, Gail. <laughs> I think Dave has a new member on the worship team. What a great story. That, that, what a great testimony. And I'm sure, Duke, you looked great in your suit. <laughs> um, I'm going to share the announcements with you all this morning. Um, today, after church, the single ladies are meeting for lunch at Lacey Dalby's house. And Lacey's right back there. Um, so if you are a single lady and would like to um, fellowship, then uh, let Lacey know that you'll be coming. Um, on Tuesday evening at 6.30 p.m. is um, out me and Victor's Harvest um, Home Group. And you're all welcome to come and fellowship and a time of worship and prayer and ministry and just really um, just a good time of, of getting to know each other outside of outside of Sunday morning. Um, so our address is um, in the lobby with um, on, on a flyer. Um, on Wednesday evening at 7 p.m., oh, that's also our anniversary, too, on Tuesday, me and Victor's anniversary. It'll be 35 years, I think. Something like that, I don't know. <laughs> um, back to Wednesday. Okay, so Wednesday at 7 p.m., um, is our prayer and worship time over in the Logos building. So if you want to come and just really intercede and, and pray, um, then meet over there at 7 p.m. on Wednesday. On Friday evening at 7 p.m. Um, is our Hearts Ignited worship night, which I'm really excited about. So um, we're just going to come meet at Yeah, you excited too? <laughs> So um, just meet here at 7 p.m. Um, child care, however, is not provided, but it is a worship night, so you can, I mean, just bring your kids and let them worship and maybe make them a little area, a little spot where they can, um, you know, just worship on their own. Um, so that's Friday evening at 7. Then on Saturday at 2 o'clock from 2 to 3.30 p.m., um, at my home, I'm having a women's planning meeting. Um, I just want to hear from some of you ladies about some ideas that you might have for the upcoming year um, and just to get together and if there's an area that in particular you would like to help with, um, I want to hear about it. So that's at 2 o'clock at my home. Um, and it, if you could let me know um, if you're coming, that would be great too. We'll have a few little snacks, you know, so. Um, on Monday night, we are resuming our inner healing classes from 7 o'clock to 8 p.m. And that those are really, really good classes, um, really life-changing, really good topics, topics that really, you know, deal with, with our heart and relationships. So if you can come out on Monday night from 7 to 8 p.m., you'll learn a lot. You'll get a lot out of those classes. So I think that is it for now. And now, our wonderful pastor, <laughs> Rich Manganero. Look forward to hearing what the word Lord has for us today. Okay. Anybody need healing in here? Yeah, we got that uh, 
through throughout the worship, there was a real uh, encouragement, the theme about this believing God to do the impossible, Jackie's uh, exhortation, uh, claiming the healing. I like Steve Long's prayer, this healing belongs to me. I'm healed because of what Jesus has done for me uh, at the whipping and on the cross. Uh, then we had a, a, a tongue spoken out and um, interpreted about not doubting and uh, pressing in. So I think that the Lord's been, uh, you know, helping us uh, with what's upon his heart for, you know, for his people, for, for us, and, and, uh, and just believing and not giving up and just going for it. No matter what we see in the natural around us, God's greater than it all. And I have to believe that God who has started a work in me will finish it. God who has started a work in Harvest Church will finish it. Uh, God who started a work with the church 2,000 years ago will finish it. And uh, like uh, uh, Gail was saying, uh, we, the decisions we make here affect us for eternity. It's funny, I had somebody else tell me that uh, recently. So we're just kind of like uh, stopping by here in the sense of uh, we're just, life is like a vapor, it's like a, it's like a blade of grass. I mean, it's here one day and it's gone. And uh, yeah, that's a good way of putting it, Gail. Matthew changed addresses. So now he gets mail in heaven. And uh, that was a good way of putting it. We miss him. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, if I send him a letter, <laughs> he'll get it. And once in a while I will say, hi, Matt. I hope it's going good up there. Uh, so, but we miss you. So, what does the Lord have for us today as a congregation? Uh, I thought we had an incredible word last week. If you didn't get a chance to listen to it, uh, you can go on YouTube, I believe, and you can get it uh, about the story about St. Patrick. Uh, incredible. Uh, great word, John Friel. Give him a clap. Go ahead. Just so encouraging. Wow. I just I didn't know all that you know concerning concerning him so and uh, it's good to have David Culp back I mean yeah yeah there he is David right yeah yeah I always forget so it's good to have you back and if you're new here for the first time uh, we welcome you so are you ready so just just say a prayer for me and just the prayer can be Lord, anoint Rich. Anoint him with his power, with your power. Anoint him, Lord, with the flow of the Spirit. Anoint him to give a message, Lord. Anoint him, Lord, because it's the anointing that breaks yoke and bondage. It's the anointing that encourages us. It's the anointing that does so much. In this particular uh, sermon, I was seeking in the Lord... Uh, I don't know, Friday or Saturday, and I said, Lord, what do you have for Harvest Church? And he said, tell Harvest Church to keep pressing in. And uh, I said, okay, Lord. So where do you want to go with that? Because there's many examples of men and women of God who pressed in. And I was taken to the scriptures found in Matthew, Luke, and Mark concerning the woman with the issue of blood. And so I started to study that out and this saw so many, so many great things in that particular story. And I want to take you there with me this morning. And I hope you leave here with an encouragement, and I hope you leave here with a sense of just, yes, I'm going to press in, no matter what the obstacles are in the natural, I'm going to press in the sea and get my healing of what God has promised me. I don't know about you, but I'm waiting on some of the promises of God over my life and over this church. I think about them every day. I want to see them come to pass, and I'm pressing into those promises. 
And James chapter 4, verse 8 says, draw nigh unto God, he'll draw nigh unto you. But it also says something interesting in the same scripture. It says, cleanse your heart, you sinners, and don't be double-minded. Which basically means if you're going to draw nigh unto God, you got to make sure that you have this singleness within your heart, that you're not going to be double-minded, you're not going to do it one day or and not do it the next, but you're going to be sold out for him, and you're going to say, Lord, I know if I draw an eye unto you, you're going to draw an eye unto me. Now, God happens to hang out with people, according to Psalm 34, 18, that God will draw an eye unto those who are a broken heart and saves one whose spirit is contrite or crushed. We know that the Lord will hang out with people who are just broken and desperate and contrite and humble and allow him. He just loves to hang out with those people. But I really believe within all my heart that God just loves to hang out with people. But there are times within my life where I need him more than other times, depending on what I'm going through and what fiery trials upon my life. When it comes to family, that's going to get me on my knees. When it comes to this church and some of the people in this church, hopefully all the people in this church, I will draw nigh unto him and it will get me on my knees. When it comes to my country and what's happening in this country, at times in my prayer, it will get me on my knees and I'll break my heart with the things that are happening around me. And I feel God's presence drawing nigh unto me and he comforts me and he says, I got this rich, the world is in my hands. When it comes to uh, just life in general, sometimes uh, we get hit with things that we don't expect, uh, and before you know it, uh, we sense and we feel and we say, God, draw nigh unto me. I need your help, and you're a very present help in any time of trouble that I'm going through. What I'm trying to say is that God is not distant. He's very much near. But uh, there are times in the scripture where we see that there are people that just press through the obstacles and said, I got to get to him because I need a touch from him. I need a touch from the Lord, to be honest with you. I do. I need a touch from you, Lord. And I hear him say, just draw nigh unto me, Rich. Press through the obstacles and what you see in the natural, and I'll touch you. And a day in his presence, (laughs) a minute in his presence can change my heart like nothing else, can flood in encouragement, can lift me up, and I can speak to my soul and say, Why you cast down on my soul, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Three different areas in scripture, Matthew, Luke, Mark, all recount this particular story. A little bit of the backstory about this particular woman is that she had 12 years of misery, 12 years of disappointment, 12 years of financial ruin. She had no relationships probably no friends. She was probably just uh, very isolated. She was searching. She had 12 years of shame, sorrow, grief. And I can't imagine the 12 years of people judging her for her condition. I can't imagine that part. So you see that in this particular, in this particular account of the scriptures, we see here that she was so much in need. And it says here in Luke, uh, I believe it's uh, uh, Luke chapter 8, verse 43. And it was when Jesus returned that the multitudes welcomed him and they, they were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus who was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house. Why? Because he had his only daughter, who was 12 years of age, and she was dying. You have somebody who's 12 years old, you have somebody with a 12-year affliction. But as he went, the multitudes just 
thronged him, pressed him. But a woman, having a flow of blood for 12 years, spent all her livelihood on physicians and cannot be healed by any. In another account, Mark and Matthew add similar things, but it says in their accounts, suffered on the man's efforts, efforts, spent everything, and I think Mark says, grew worse. They all account, similar to Matthew and to Luke, they all account together that she touched his clothes, and they all account uh, that there was uh, certain tassels that uh, rabbis had in the bottom of their, of their garment, and those tassels were in the color of blue representing in Deuteronomy the word of God. And they, they, and I think two out of the three account that she went for that. She didn't go over his shoulder. She didn't touch him in the back. She went for the, she, she went for the hem of the garment. She went for those tassels, it's believed. And uh, so she, she had a specific, a specific uh, uh, thought within her, within her, within her heart. Uh, this particular condition that she was experiencing, uh, she was not allowed in the temple, uh, not allowed to touch another person or be touched. And according to the laws of Leviticus, in chapter 11 of Leviticus, anybody who she touched or was touched by her had to cleanse themselves and be apart from the camp for seven days. Uh, I can't understand the magnitude of that. I can't understand the emotional magnitude of it, the physical magnitude, but could you imagine getting resources and spending all that you have year after year, physician after physician, and not getting any better, but actually growing worse? Um, that's rough. And uh, I, I was trying to think of something that I could share personally with you to relate to it in my own life. And I really couldn't think of anything that matched it. Um, we can just go by, you know, this this story here, and I, I I just can't imagine the magnitude of her condition. It makes my problems or the problems that I've gone through within my life seem pretty small. Not that God doesn't look at them. And think the same way towards my problems, but I uh, just was thinking, wow, I didn't have, to, I, 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 I haven't gone through that. And yet, she ends up in the Gospels, three out of the four. And uh, her story has probably been told thousands of times by sermons, preachers. And we got to dive into it a little bit deeper to get even more of a revelation on what was happening. I just know this much. She was desperate. She wanted to be healed. And she spent any, every dime on it. And she was willing, willing to risk her life because the possibilities of her being stoned was real. Um, and her reputation. Uh, talk about going through obstacles. But Jesus is on a mission to heal. He's healthy, he's walking, and he's going to Jairus' house, and he is surrounded. She is, on the other hand, hemorrhaging and quarreling. But Mark says she heard about Jesus. Somebody must have said something about him. And somebody... And faith comes by hearing what she was actually going to be seeing and touching the word of God. So the scripture 
points out something really powerful. And, but as she went, the multitudes, for as he went, the multitudes pressed upon him. Now, a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years, spent all that she had on physicians, came from behind, touched the border of his garment, and immediately the flow of blood stopped. Now, uh, Mark adds something I thought was really, really good. And uh, uh, Mark says that a certain woman with a flow of blood for 12 years, suffered many things, spent all that she had. When she heard about Jesus, she came from behind in the crowd, touched his garment. But Mark and Matthew add this. For she said, if I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. In Matthew's account, it was more of the repetitive where she is probably she's saying as she's pressing through the crowd, if I just touch the hem of his garment, if I just cut, touch his clothes, I will be made well. But she doesn't stop. She probably recounts it over and over and over again. And what I want to instill within you today, which I feel that God's instilling within me, and I'll take this to the bank because it made a deposit within me when I was studying it, that I believe that faith wants to have the opportunity within my heart to speak up in the midst of obstacles and in the midst of going through difficult times that, that I keep my eye on the prize and I begin to begin to allow faith to rise up, uh, and I begin to press through the, the obstacles, and I begin to say it over and over and over again until there is a reality, because faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen yet, according to Hebrews. So that means when I'm walking in this place within my life uh, where faith is allowed to speak forward, uh, even though I might not see the results, I can believe by faith that I'm going to get the results when I have an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the Father. And I say, Lord, uh, I know uh, I'm facing obstacles. I know you are facing obstacles. And I know that the church is facing obstacles corporately. But I want to see what I'm not seeing by faith and allow it to rise up within me. And if I got to press through the crowd and press through the doubts and press through the disbelief and press through my past, my present, my future, if I got to press through it, then I'm going to say, Lord, strengthen me with all your might and with all your power because it's not by might nor by power but by your spirit let it flow through me even though I'm not seeing it I want to believe for it even though I'm not seeing righteousness reign within this country I can still by faith believe that righteousness will reign within this country and that the kingdom of God there's no end to it even though I don't, I don't have my full family worshiping him and accepting him, I still got unsaved members. I can speak their names by faith. I can press through the crowd and I can say, Lord, get those people saved so everybody in my household is saved, just like the jailer in the book of Acts. If I'm waiting for a financial breakthrough, then of course tithe for peace sakes. But if I'm waiting for it, then call it down and allow the kingdom of God to come forward and allow the prosperity of God to fill you. Hallelujah. I don't know. I think that this is an amazing lesson by this woman that we can take to the bank and we can see and we can relate and we can say, I'm going to press into the prize and the mark of the calling of the heart of Jesus Christ. Don't worry about me. I've been working out, so I'm not going to get a stroke or a heart attack. <laughs> yeah, I've been going to this gym three or four times a week. Man, there are people there that are just buffed. This is incredible. I saw one guy that looked like a tree trunk yesterday. <laughs> Reminded me of Mitch back there. I mean, this guy was built. And I said, Lord, that's the prize I want. I want to look like that guy. 
He says, Rich, don't set your sights too high. <laughs> I can you tell I'm this not satisfied where I'm at? I am not satisfied with where this church is at. I am not satisfied. I'm content, don't get me wrong, but I'm not satisfied. And honestly, I don't know if I'll ever be satisfied until I'm with him. I think I, I, I mean, I hear a story about St. Patrick for Pete's sakes. What a guy turned the country upside down. I'm trying to say, turn a city upside down. What, what's, what part of your life is bleeding? Is it your marriage that's bleeding? What part of your life is bleeding? That you're so desperate. And you've tried different things and hasn't gotten you anywhere. There's a savior out there. Closer than we think, we sung about him this morning. Or maybe you know somebody that's bleeding. So, what are you saying? What am I saying over and over and over again? Uh, recently, for the past couple of weeks, what I've been saying over and over and over again is, Lord, I got this dream two years ago to start a Bible school. And then I got a prophetic word from a prophet who didn't know anything about it. I'm saying that over and over and over again. Oh, Rich, why are you doing that? Because sometimes I doubt. And the doubts come in like, did I really? Did that really happen? Is this really the Lord? Come on, I'm just being honest with you. I doubt about things. So I say it over and over again. Lord, Lord, remember that prophetic word you spoke through this prophet? Remember the dream you gave me? I'm just reminding you. If you can guys can give me another formula or how to battle, let me know. But I think Paul said to Timothy, use the prophetic words over your life to hit the enemy with. So, our, you know, as uh, with Logos, I think we have six students right now, and I need, to, I need 20 to break even. So, I keep reminding them, Lord, send them in. But you know what? If you just take that and relate it to this story, part of this story is all about timing. Why 12 years? I, I don't know the mysteries of God, of why things happen. Why wasn't it just two years or one year? All as I know is that I have to believe that God's timing is perfect. And there was a divine encounter that was going to happen on that, on, that, on, on that road, in that town, in that hour. And maybe those 12 years for this woman got her so desperate that she didn't give a blank about what people were going to think. Did anybody put in a bad word? <laughs> but I know this much. When faith begins to speak and rise up within us, watch out. It's powerful. It's like a two-edged sword. 
Watch out, because Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Those who love it will eat its fruit. But I love speaking life, and I want to eat the fruit of life. Yeah. His words, her words, were about to produce a lifetime of fruit that is still going on because the word is living and we still got to partake of reading about this woman. Wow. Be careful what you say. I catch myself. You ever say a phrase like, this is going to kill me? Or I feel like death warmed over. Horrible stuff to say. Sometimes it just flows right out of the mouth. Or my better days are behind me. The only problem is God says that the path of the righteous gets brighter and brighter. Proverbs 4.18. The enemy is too strong. The only problem is the word of God says greater is he that's within you. Or the book of Joel says let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich. So you see the contrary things that are going on many times? As she's pressing through, she's saying it. What looks impossible on the outside is becoming very real reality on the inside. What is in me? Christ in me, the hope of glory coming out on the inside. Well, the scripture goes on to say, Jesus says this, immediately the fountain... Uh, uh, of a blood dried up. She felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him. <laughs> you know, I think we serve somebody that has a limited resource of power. Limited. Unlimited resource of power. So he knows with himself and says, who touched me? Now, Luke says they all denied it. That means that she who got touched denied that she got touched. Why? She what? Afraid. Shameful. She's going to say I got touched because uh, I've been bleeding for 12 years. They would have scattered away from her and probably would have been so angry that she was even in public. She denies it. And Peter and those say to him, Master, <laughs> the multitudes press upon you, and you say who touched me? Now, take it apart a tiny bit. In the sense of, I don't want to be part of the multitudes when he's around, I want to make sure I touch him. I don't want to go through the motions. When I'm in a worship service, I want to touch him. When I'm in my prayer closet, I want to touch him. I think they all had the opportunity to touch him. Well, they were. But virtue wasn't pouring out except on one person. Peter, I love it. I would have said the same thing. Who touched you, Lord? Everybody's touching you. No, this touch was different because this touch had faith attached to it. So when you're with the Lord and your faith is attached to your prayer, and though whatever is happening in the outside, on the outside, and whatever you're seeing, if faith is attached to it, it's going to touch the heart of God and watch out for virtue. Because virtue, the virtue of God went out. The power, the dunamis of God went out. <sighs> Our walk has to be about encounters, his presence. We can't just be part of the crowd. We have to be the one who's having the experience with the Lord. I want the virtue and the power to pour out on me. 
I'm on my oil filled up, Father. I'm on my soul glad, my heart rejoicing, my spirit soaring, and my mind envisioning what you can do. I want it all, Father. Jesus doesn't give up. You know why he didn't give up? Because her healing wasn't complete. Do you think God was just interested in touching her physically? That was just part of it. So Jesus said, somebody touched me. Power has gone out of me, virtue. Now when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling. Falling down before him, she declared to him, in the presence of all the people, the reason she had touched him and how she had been healed immediately. Now, this is interesting. In Isaiah 6, verse 1, it says, In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and his train of his temple filled the a train, his train filled the temple, which means there the word for train is the hem of his garment filled the temple. And a little bit about that King Uzziah was that under his reign, Israel prospered. There was national prosperity for, I believe, over 50 years. But it kind of went to his head, poor guy. And he decided one day, I think I'll go into the tabernacle, the temple, and I'll burn incense. Not good. Eighty of the prophets confronted him and said, what are you doing? You're not supposed to be burning incense. You're a king. You're not a priest. Well, the Lord didn't like that. And what do you think happens to this king? He gets struck with leprosy. And eventually he dies as a leopard. Not good. But the country is in disarray. They just lost a prosperous king because they had years of prosperity. But it didn't work out very good for the king. He dies. And Isaiah looks up the prophet. He looks up and he goes, I see the Lord sitting on a throne. He's high and lifted up. And his train, his garment, his hem is filling the temple. You can read about King Uzziah in 2 Chronicles 26. But it means there that she touched the clothing, <laughs> I believe, of the father's garment that the son was wearing. Now we see that Jesus not only wants her to have an encounter with him and physical healing flows through him. She gets touched. But now I, I, I fully believe that he, Jesus wants the woman to have an encounter with the Father's love. Proven by, I think, the next verse when he says to her, and he said to her after she revealed everything, daughter, right there, he spoke identity to her. Someone who was known as an outcast, someone who was known who could even go into the temple, and you see the father's love flowing through the son, who she touches a seamless garment. No beginning, no end. Alpha and the Omega. Always was, always will be. She touches that, and eternity pours into her. And identity takes over. And he restores her birthright as a daughter. I don't know what's the greatest miracle. That right there, they both were great. They both were amazing. 
She comes clean, tells everyone what happened. Our defilement, guys, doesn't defile him. <laughs> he gives it back her identity as the father's daughter. And on the cross, he took all that defilement. But when I go to him, and I'm going to lay it all out on the table, just like she did, I guarantee you what the Lord will do is introduce me again to the Father's love and pour upon me that sense of identity and purpose knowing I'm a son who will call me by name. Can you close the lights? And I thought The Chosen did an incredible account of this woman and what was done to her. Can these lights be also turned off? Amen. Turn them all off. Sorry, Sharon. Just turn them all down. There you go. And if you can play that clip, just kind of watch it, and it will encourage you. Thank you. 
stay here longer. Listen to him. Turn on. And a pitch is worth a thousand words, right? But uh, I hope everybody lives here today, allowing their faith to lead them. And no matter what you're facing, no matter what obstacles, no matter how long you've been facing it, how do you know that this is, wouldn't be your day or your week? Or that very hour, that something rises up within you, and you believe for the impossible. You keep saying it over and over again. And no matter how shame you might feel about it, or, or what the past, or whatever it could be, I think we've got to learn a lesson today, that the Lord is looking for people who are going to be desperate. That will draw nigh unto him and will press through whatever the crowds might be in the way. Everybody here, I believe, has a word of faith within them. And if you have faith as big as a mustard seed, you can say to that mountain, be removed. It doesn't take much, but believe for the impossible. And I tell you, when it happens, the glory of God will be revealed and he will get the glory and the praise. Just like we just watched. Let's all stand. Thank you, Father. If you can relate to this sermon, I believe we all can to some degree. But if something is tugging upon your heart that you just feel like, oh, I wanted to give up. No. But now you feel faith saying, don't give up. Press in. Believe. Watch it happen. Touch the garment. Touch them. And don't leave until you feel that virtue pour out from his presence. From the Father, from the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If that's you, then raise your hand so that people around you can just touch you with encouragement. Thank you, Father. So, do you guys see some of the hands that are raised? Look around and go to that person. Go ahead. You can walk out of your seats. You need a touch. You're in a desperate situation. If the problem's gone on for years, and you just need a touch today, the body of Christ is standing with you. The faith is coming alongside of your faith, strengthening it, believing for it. Father God, we need a touch. We want to touch the garment, Lord. We want to, Father, press through the crowd and through the obstacles, Father. And, Lord, we want to touch, Lord, that garment, Father. Lord, we not only can touch the garment, Lord, we can touch, Lord, your heart. We can walk before your throne of grace right now and receive help and strength in the time of need. Father, all things are possible with you. Lord, remove the doubts and the disbelief and cause faith to rise up that we would say over and over again within our hearts, Lord, I'm going to win this battle. 
I'm going to run through a troop and leap over a wall. I'm going to be victorious. I'm going to get the victory. I'm going to believe and receive the healing. I'm going to receive the breakthrough. I'm going to walk differently. I'm going to touch your garment, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that your train fills the temple, Father. And, Lord, you are in control. The government sits upon your shoulders. And I believe, Father, that you are able to do abundantly, exceedingly, whatever we ask or think. So, Father, strengthen those that have raised their hands. And, Lord, strengthen us all that, Father, that we would go forth with joy and be led forth in peace and believe, as it says by the prophet Joel, Father, the weak say I am strong, the poor say I am rich. Father God, do it. Do it, Lord. Do it, Father. This church needs an encounter. This church needs revival, Father. I'm going to believe for it. I'm going to say it over and over again within my heart. And I'm going to press through the crowd, Lord, believing, Father, that breakthroughs, breakthroughs, breakthroughs are coming for Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, and the United States and around the world. Father, we think big today. We think big, Father. And may no obstacles stand in the way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, if anybody would like prayer, by the prayer team, come up for prayer. Guys, be filled. Look around. Invite somebody to lunch. And just enjoy the rest of your day. See you Wednesday night for prayer.